All right, so let's look at how we actually estimate a logit model, and we're going to use maximum likelihood estimation to do that. The idea here is that we observe the following data about a discrete choice setting. We observe a vector of choices. So we see for every decision maker, which alternative are they choosing? And we can think about that as being a set of zero and ones, uh, a variable that's a set of zero and ones. A one if the decision maker actually chooses that alternative and a zero if they don't. So y sub ni is gonna equal one if and only if decision maker n chooses alternative i. It's going to equal zero for all of those other alternatives that the decision maker does not choose. So we can think of that as kind of like our outcome variable here, this one zero indicator for what alternative is chosen. And then we also observe uh, this matrix of data that we're going to call capital X uh, that's going to include attributes about the alternatives and maybe some information on decision makers as well. And so in order to use maximum likelihood estimation, we need to make an assumption about how these y variables are distributed and, and really how they're distributed conditional on the x's. Well, let's think about what these y variables are. These y variables are basically a binary or a Bernoulli random variable. Right? They can only take a zero or a one. It's not a continuous variable like a normal or something like that. It's a binary random variable that, that's in fact actually a Bernoulli random variable. And so in order to define the distribution of these y's, all we need to do is define what is the probability that any particular y has, takes on a value of one and what's the probability that it takes on a value of zero. Well, in this case, y is going to take on the value of one if and only if the decision maker chooses that alternative. So what is the probability that y equals one? That's going to be the probability that the decision maker chooses that alternative, which we've already defined. That's just a choice probability. So in some sense, we don't even have to make any additional assumptions here. The assumptions of the logit model have already given us a distribution for our outcome variable, the y's, that we can use with maximum likelihood estimation. So to say this a little more clearly, under the random utility model, we can think about all of these y's as being binary or Bernoulli random variables that have a conditional probability mass function just equal to the choice probability. To say that again, the probability that any one of these outcomes equals one is the probability that the decision maker chooses that alternative, which we've already previously defined to just be choice probability. That's just kind of a definitional statement. And here I've added a few extra variables onto our choice probability just to make it clear that these choice probabilities depend on x's and thetas, that they depend on data and parameters. So this is kind of a general statement. Uh, if we make the logit assumption, we have a, a, an actual formula we can plug in for these choice probabilities, right? And then this, this probability mass function for our y's uh, just simplifies to uh, this expression here that we've seen before for, for the logit model, just the logit choice probabilities. And so we can see really clearly here that the probability mass function or the probability that any y takes on a value of one is this particular function of all decision makers data and the parameters of the model that we want to estimate. And so we're going to use this distributional assumption to estimate the maximum likelihood estimator for our logit model. Now, really, we don't just observe one y variable for each decision maker. We observe a y for every one of the possible alternatives, right? If there are five alternatives, we observe five outcomes, and we know one of them is going to equal one, and the other four are going to equal zero. So ultimately, we want an expression for the probability of that full kind of vector of outcomes for one decision maker. Well, because they can only choose one alternative, once they've chosen that alternative, we know everything else has to be zero with a 100% probability. And so the probability of observing any particular set of outcomes for a decision maker is just the choice probability of the chosen alternative. Let me say this a little bit differently. Suppose there are three alternatives and they choose number one then the probability that we observe 
y1 equals 1, y2 equals 0, and y3 equals 0, that's just the probability that y1 equals 1. Because once y1 equals 1, the other ones have to be 0. And so a simple way that we can express this, what we're basically expressing here is what is the probability that the decision maker chooses the, the chosen alternative. This is kind of a convenient mathematical expression for that. We take the choice probability for each alternative. We raise it to the power of y, that's zero or one, and then we just multiply them all together. For the alternative that's actually chosen, y is gonna equal one, and so we're gonna get the actual choice probability here. For the alternatives that are not chosen, y is gonna equal zero, Raising anything to the power of zero gives us a one. And so those are just gonna turn into ones. And so what we're left with is just finding what is the probability that the decision maker would choose the alternative that we actually observe them choosing. Then if we assume that each, in, uh, each decision maker is independent, then the probability of observing a series of choices among many decision makers because they're independent, it's just gonna be the product of each individual's probability. And so if we want to know not just what's the probability of observing a choice for one individual, but what's the probability of, ob of observing a set of choices among many decision makers, we take that expression from, the, la uh, for, from the, the first expression we looked at on this slide, and we can just multiply that through for every single decision maker. And so we get this kind of double product here where we're multiplying over all decision makers and all alternatives. We're gonna take the choice probability and raise it to the power of y. Of course, once we've made the logit assumption, now we actually have an expression for this choice probability that we can plug in and we can, we can do that and we can see here that it's, it's just that logit choice probability that we, we should all be familiar with at this point. Um, and we can once again really clearly see that the kind of jo the, the joint distribution of all of our outcomes for all of our decision makers can be expressed by this kind of product operator here that depends on uh, all of the decision makers data and on those parameters that we want to estimate. Okay, so we have an expression for our joint PMF, but when we think about a joint density or joint mass function, we're kind of implying that we know our data and our parameters and we want to know the probabilities of outcomes. But, but that's not actually what we, what we have here. We observe outcomes and data, and we want to estimate those theta parameters. And so remember, this seems like a little bit of a trick, but we can just use the exact same mathematical object, but think about it in a different way. Instead of using that joint PMF and thinking about knowing x's and thetas and, and y's being unknown, there's no reason we can't use that exact same expression Assume that we know the y's and x's and that the thetas are our unknown variables. And when we make that kind of conceptual switch, now we call this the likelihood function of theta rather than the PMF of y. So the likelihood function of theta, conditional on the outcomes and the data that we observe, it's that exact same mathemat mathematical expression we ended up with on the last slide. And of course, if we make the logit assumption, we can plug in those logit choice probabilities here for us. So the key part here is that what we, what we don't know are thetas. That's what we wanna find. And now we have constructed this likelihood function, which is a function of thetas conditional on our data as opposed to the converse. All right, that likelihood function is a little messy to deal with because we've got these double products. Um, but what we can do is take the, the log and get the log likelihood instead. That's almost always going to be easier to work with. So if we take the log of that thing, what we end up with is instead of the product, we get the sums. We're summing over all the individuals, uh, decision makers, and summing over all the alternatives. And then we can just take y times the log of the choice probability. Remember, this y is going to equal 
zero for the alternatives that are not chosen. And then you can kind of think about that as just disappearing. And all that we're left with then is that this is going to equal a one for the alternatives that are chosen. And so we're basically just taking for each decision maker, which alternative was chosen, take that choice probability, log it, and then add them all up. As with before, if we make the logit assumption, we can plug in those logit choice probabilities and even more clearly see that this uh, log likelihood, the log likelihood function of theta conditional on our y's and x's is this big function here of y's, x's, and importantly, our thetas. And so we're just gonna treat this essentially as the y's and x's as being fixed because we already know those data and then thinking about the thetas as being our, our kind of possible variables to consider different values of thetas. You know, one thing we're gonna do a lot in this class just to kind of further simplify this is to just assume that representative utility is linear. So for all of these Vs, we can actually plug in just beta times X instead of V to more kind of specifically represent what the utility looks like. And then we can see here kind of even more clearly how we have this, this log likelihood of our parameters. We'll call them betas now instead of thetas, but we could call them whatever we want. But the log likelihood of our parameters conditional on our observed outcomes and observed data is this function of our y's, our x's, and our betas. So what are we going to do? Well, the maximum likelihood estimator, remember, is just the set of parameters that maximizes the log likelihood function. So we just want to take the, one of those log likelihood functions from the last slide and figure out which set of parameters is the one that maximizes that log likelihood function. That's going to find us the set of parameters that make it most likely to have generated the choices that we actually observe. And what that is really kind of doing on a more intuitive level is it's it is the maximum likelihood estimator is basically trying to make the choice probabilities as close as possible to one for all of the chosen alternatives and as close as possible to zero for all of the, the alternatives that are not chosen. And so we can get some first order conditions from this maximization problem, just that the derivative of the log likelihood with respect to theta should equal zero for every one of our thetas, right? If we have five parameters, we're gonna have five different thetas. So we'll have five different first order conditions here, for example. Unfortunately, with the logit model, uh, these first order conditions do not have a closed form solution. And so we're gonna need to use numerical optimization to actually find that maximum likelihood estimator. And that's what we're going to do in, uh, in class this week is actually use R to set up a log likelihood function for a logit model and then use numerical optimization to find the set of parameters that maximizes that log likelihood function. So that's going to be the main way that we estimate the, the logit model. There are a few other methods we can use for certain situations that we might encounter and we're going to talk about those in the next video.